and uh, what we are going to talk about is uh, what we learned in this process about creation of uh, assistive technology and why uh, we learned why uh, you know we need a technology ecosystem and what the technology ecosystem is all about is what we are going to share so it's about designing an assistive technology ecosystem for the visually impaired and before we go to you know the technology ecosystem i know you all have had a large dose about disability and you know there are experts also in this team here right now uh, from, i mean but a little bit of overview a bird's eye view on uh, disability and the evolving nature of the concept of disability as we perceive it uh, will be important for us so that you know we can place vision empowers activities in that light so as uh, most of you i mean know and in the morning i think uh, jarjit also uh, discussed a lot about the medical model so when if you look at disability as a concept right from the 1970s the definition of disability was about a classification it was about giving a taxonomy to the word it's about uh classifying people with disabilities under various buckets and you know the, there were nine of these and then there were sub categories under each one of those so eventually it was about creating a framework of understanding the context of each disability and the policies that were created was around each kind of disability so it was about classifying people who fell under each of these now by the 80s basically this model continued this individual medical model and you basically had a, a system where any disability was like an hand, a handicap in society but was the root cause of which was a disease a medical problem so the solutions which were created for those were also around the medical model always there was something to do with the individual medical model slowly towards the end of that decade there were gradually critics of this model <coughs> and people started talking about disability not being a product of a pathology right it was a specific social and economic perspective that needed to change right and that became eventually uh, uh, talked about a lot people started writing about it and uh, this went on for quite some time but it was only in the you know uh, about maybe the early 2000s is when the concept of disability the perspective changed a little further where now you started the united nations came out with the cprd and you know all of that and then you basically had the concept of mental and intellectual and sensory impairment being included within the you know framework of disability and it was about then participation of these people in society on an equal basis with others and at that time disabilities uh, became more more than a social problem it was it was something that required not just participation in terms of being physically present but also in terms of mental participation now at the same time you will notice that along this time as the dis concept of disability the perspective of disability changed over decades in parallel there was another great change happening and that was to do with technologies technologies also parallelly were changing and if you know if you around that time this was a famous uh, quote from stephen hawking who said that disability need not be an obstacle to success because he was successful despite being so disabled and what he said if you if in this entire statement was he recognized that though he did, he was able to succeed in what he was doing he said majority of people with disabilities in the world have an extremely difficult time so it began to dawn on people by then that it would not be possible to solve the problem just by creating you know technologies or being able to uh, address a particular section of people and by 2014 is when you see 
that the United Nations comes out with a statement saying millions of people with disabilities are denied education and many more education is available on too many more education is available only when they're in isolated in isolation. So this is when you start recognizing that there's a huge number of people who fall under the disability, you know, umbrella. And you learnt about it in the morning about, you know, the different age group spectrum, all the kinds of different kinds of disabilities. This section of the population is roughly 15% of the world's population now is considered to be disabled. That is when people take notice of it and it does not remain as even a social, you know, forget a physical problem or a, a mental problem, not even a social welfare problem, it becomes a humanitarian issue. It becomes a development issue. Now the governments needed to start ratifying whatever the United Nations was publishing or, you know, each one needed to go back to their country and, you know, uh, create bills, pass bills and all that. And also along with that, like I said, for the uh, assistive technologies, uh, were becoming another policy, policy objectives by the uh, United Nations. So this was going on in parallel. So by 2015, you find that accessible and uh, in ICTs became a major policy objective for the persons with disabilities. Now, once it became a, you know, a, a development issue, one very important thing that got recognized, as you saw in the previous slide about the education, uh, you know, being uh, one of the most critical elements, right, in development. So this is where you come up with the United Nations comes up with the, uh, you know, acknowledgement that inclusive education is required for all, where all students can, you know, study together under the, in the same classroom maybe. And how would, was that going to be possible? So one is, like we said, all kinds of technologies, accessible accessible technologies, assistive technologies needed to get uh, rolled out and all countries needed to ratify this. And this is what happened by 2007, India also ratified it. But if you notice, despite all this, it was only in 2016 that India actually implemented the new rights for persons with disabilities and this is a very, uh, you know, uh, interesting uh, statement in that bill. It says that it provides individual autonomy, including the freedom to make one's own choices, right? So this is what the legally every disabled person in this country is entitled to, the freedom to choose what they want to study, how they want to move around, where they want to live, what job they want to do. These are all granted by the law, right? Now we basically come to, since we've come to, you know, the context we've kind of presented to you, how disability changed as a perspective and we've come to India, we've basically realized that, okay, this is a, this is the challenge. Vidya will tell you about what is the magnitude of the challenge as far as India is concerned. We have um, 285 million people who are in um, and uh, this is in the world and 90% of them are in developing countries. So here, uh, when we refer to visually impaired, so it doesn't mean completely blind. Okay, so the visual impairment can change uh, between different levels. So it, it is, there are people who are completely blind, there are those who can see little, then legally blind, and um, some of them cannot see very little. So, so there are different whole range of people among the visually impaired. And uh, 39 million people in the world are completely blind and uh, 246 million have severe or mod uh, moderate visual impairment and out of this one third of the world's blind population are in India. So here we should note that one sixth of the uh, population in the world are in India out of which one third, I mean uh, out of like one third of the blind population are in India, but one sixth of the world's population are in India. Why is it so? Because many people are just not aware of like uh, eyesight related issues. Most of them are preventable cases of blindness. That's why 90% of the people in developing, uh, developing countries have visual impairment. And uh, out of the uh, Indian blind population, 
that just 0.77 million which is like 7.7 .7 lakh people attend school so there are 11 lakh children who are in the age group 5 to 19 but out of which only 68% attend school so uh, this is the status and uh, and when coming to stem education so um, there are less than 100 people who are graduated who, who have studied stem related courses in graduate and post graduate level so this is just uh, 11 lakh children are in this generation now imagine how many generations have gone by out of all these generations just 100 students have uh, taken STEM education, science, technology uh, and such courses in graduate and postgraduate level. So this is the magnitude of the problem in India. Yeah, so uh, basically um, you know this to highlight the magnitude of, of STEM, the, uh, the problem of STEM education for the visually impaired, this is uh, what Milan Keller told you. Yeah, can you share that? Yeah, so, um, in, uh, so Helen Keller wrote this, so when she was, she was there, she says algebra and geometry are the only uh, courses which she found it difficult. And remember this is in 1898. So math was one of the toughest subjects for her and because a whole lot of issues were existing even then. She tells something about her college that the college wasn't aware of how to cater to her needs and how, how they should teach her math courses. So this was long back when she was alive. Yeah and so about 120 years later now in her country ICTs are existing now in developed countries which can make there is enough research and more to show that ICTs do help in education of the visually impaired. It helps them to pick up science and math education and there are teachers who have who actually use those. You can see here these these technology names are there which basically these are used. The question is where are they being used and who is using them and how is it affordable by everybody right. So, now juxtapose this to India, 120 years later in India now, how is this? Yeah, so um, like as you saw in the previous slide that there are a lot of technologies that are used in developed countries like US but here in India we still have an issue like when we go to one of the schools so there are computers, it's not like there are no computers many uh, people donate, to compu uh, donate computers to blind schools because they feel that they can use it but computers are functional, if the issue is not even like they are not working, they are they're working and they are in good conditions and people have computer classes, the kids have computer classes. But for what purpose they are being used, it's like when you go to the school and ask them, they just tell computer is equal to word and excel. So just they type something on the keyboard and save it in word, so these are the basic functionalities that, that um, people have people use uh, in a computer right now in India and they don't use it for any academic purposes. So uh, in Karnataka we have um, 45 blind schools out of which there is only one school that is teaching math and science in 10th grade. This is the case in most of the states in India so people drop out math uh, right from math and science right from 5th grade or 7th grade because the government has given them alternate subjects like music, political science and so on because it's it's an assumption that will mean that people cannot study science and math. Yeah. So basically this is the finding that you know if there are 45 schools for the blind in Karnataka and there's only one school which is allowing science and math after class 7. So the problem really needs attention, right? So now why what is it that technologists are, are, are to do? So if you look at this entire problem, so you know to grapple with issues of inaccessibility and exclusion, what is required now? We, one thing we you came out in the previous slide is that there are technologies and those technologies are not affordable. So affordability is one issue why we, you don't have uh, enough technologies in the schools which can enable the children to study science and math, right? But if you look at it, what is it besides price that is coming in the way? The first thing that you would see is that during the design of these assistive technologies, there is a lack of sensitivity in the design, right? There is a lack of sensitivity to the disabled community. When I am writing 
code or I'm designing a, a, a hardware, I, the person who's designing it wouldn't really uh, think of that community as being the users of whatever you know we are designing. So this lack of design sensitivity again is due to what? It's due to the exclusion of the visually impaired or any disabled person in the design process. So when you're creating assistive technologies, you basically are not taking inputs from that uh, that community because they are a minority and you think they're not users. Like what Joyjit said in the morning about visibility of uh, you know this community. They're not visible. You don't see them as users. So you don't consider and they themselves are not part of the design process. Now the question is, if they are not part of the design process, why are they not part of the design process? If you were today to expect that I as a visually impaired person should give you inputs. Today morning you saw the you know demo of JAWS and you, you know there are other assistive technologies which help. But consider a situation where you designed a technology to begin with which was accessible and you did not need an assistive technology like JAWS. Right? We didn't think of that when we were designing the technology, right? And why we didn't think about it? And like, if you want that, you know, visually impaired people or hearing impaired people or others join this community of designers, then you would have to have them, first of all, educated in STEM studies. You would have to have them go for higher education in STEM. And how would they go for higher education in STEM? First thing is they need to study science and math in school. Right? And then you can think of them going for higher studies in STEM and then become designers and then give inputs. So it's like a whole vicious cycle which is the root cause of this problem. And this is this eventually leads to what everybody is crying about, the underrepresentation of these people in the STEM field, everywhere in the developed countries as well. Now we come to what now, now you kind of have an idea of the broad scenario where Vision Empower was born. And the Vision Empower, motivation of Vision Empower is Vidya herself. She is a graduate of this institute. She was a gold medalist in the MSc Digital Society program of the uh, 2017 batch. And uh, she's an inspiration in herself. She has had tremendous you know, determination and grit to fight the system and take up science and math. And uh, she took math in her uh, bachelor's and then later she joined IIITB for the master's in digital society which she eventually topped and after she graduated she decided to work on projects to help the visually impaired study science and math. So that was what we set out with. So we started this and uh, Vidya can you say, uh, like share what the vision and mission of uh, Vision Empower was in your view? Yeah, so um, we wanted to, uh, vision was to enable every visually impaired person to have an inclusive education so that they can reach their full potential. And uh, and vision was like because we, we wanted to teach math and science, but uh, just like anybody else, the quality of education shouldn't be compromised. That's why we had to make it inclusive, and vision was. Uh, to make science and math accessible to visually impaired students because we already told you what was the problem. So now given that we, we understood broadly that okay this is a vision that we want for the organization, this is a mission we want to basically make science and math and STEM education accessible to these visually impaired students. But overall we had to come up with you know we, we didn't know how what to do exactly. So we came up with a mandate. We said we would first need to go and identify the challenges. Okay, one is Vidya herself had experienced certain, had experiences, she, there's also a TED talk of hers on the net, you can look at her. So there were a bunch of experiences, but we really needed to go to the schools to identify what were the day-to-day -day challenges that were faced by the children today. And then come up with, you know, ideas to deal with the problems that they were facing. And then even go about thinking of solving this big challenge. And then we had to come up with what are the initiatives we, we would take and how to prioritize those. So for this we came up with a plan and uh, the first year, the, this last one and a half year, we have basically been on the research phase, discovery phase. Maybe she can quickly say what we wanted to do in the research phase. 
So what we did was uh, I had already I had some insights because I had gone through the system, but we didn't want to conclude that this is the scenario right now because it was few years back. So like 2011, I passed out of school. Uh, so first what we did was we did some research, secondary research and primary research as well. Secondary research to see if there are some reports, we found uh, some of them by XRCVC which is other organization in uh, Mumbai, so they have done some research. Um, then we wanted, to, uh, we wanted to see if this scenario exists in schools in Karnataka, so we had to do um, primary data collection. So we went to schools, did some observations, had the teachers trainings and everything and we came up with some data. Then we had to find out some requirements for our solutions, basically what to focus on and what are, what are the requirements that are there. And then um, we had some proof of concepts, um, prototype. And then we we can't do this all by ourselves because so we will come to that shortly. So basically, what uh, what what uh, was there was that the first year we focused more on research. We used various research methods to understand and go with the pilot. I'll skip this. So basically, the first year was the discovery phase to try and understand, you know, and come up with a strategy so that you know we would be able to uh, enable the VI students with STEM. So. You know, I will not go into you know too much detail of what we did. We basically followed an ethnographic approach where it was a mixed approach. We we sat in observation in the classrooms, in the teacher trainings, in the you know various uh, 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 engagements that the blind students would have in you know say labs and other places. And we also you know uh, started networking with all the various players who were in this space, who were already working in this space. So. Having done that, so there are a few, you know, examples of us, how we engaged with the schools in the, you know, community. These are all some of the things we just tried to understand what was being done. So we have a, you know, a kind of a um, summary of all the people we interviewed, more than 100 people, maybe various organizations, uh, some working professionals, some sighted people who work with them, right. And uh, after all of this, we basically identified what were the main areas of concern, right? One is that you, you know, uh, you can just kind of go with the interview data and understand, but we tried and applied what we had learned here in the, you know, IT and society um, area where about doing qualitative research and we use those methods to basically come up and bucketize what were the main problems, right? So the main areas of concern, what we found in the field could be, you know, summarized as these four. The first was that you did not have accessible content. First thing, if we think of our children going to school or all of us who are cited here who went to school, the first thing that we think of about school is a, what, what do you think of first when you go to school? Paper pen. Books, right. Paper, pen, books, right. Without a book, you can't even think of studying, right. Trust me, these children do not have books. They sit in class and they take notes on their, you know, brake pad for whatever they are capable of. By the time they are, they, they gain speed in braille, they are in high school. And by then, whatever they've learned is pretty much by hearing in the classroom. So that is the first problem. You don't have accessible content. Even if you had, you know, there are people, very well-meaning people, volunteers who come to school, they read the books to them, right? Or sometimes they give them recordings also nowadays, they give them some, uh, you know, SD cards and stuff like that. But these children are not, do not, do not have access to a way to reinforce that learning. So while you have some content in some way, there's no way they go and do, like we can't even, we don't even do homework. Are you going to do math without doing math homework? Never, right? You need practice. All that just, just doesn't happen because you don't have the content from which you're going to do the homework. If you don't have the book, how are you going to do that? First thing. So that is the biggest thing and that there was basically a lack of awareness. You know, the fact is it's been going on for decades, but there nobody in the school, nobody in the system seemed to even miss a book. When we were going to the schools and asking, okay, so how are you, how did you do this? 
Oh no, we did it. So how do you do it in class? I sat through a test. I myself sat through a test. And uh, at the end of the classroom, uh, uh, sorry, at the end of the period, I walked out of the classroom and not a failure because I would not never have been able to solve the problem the way the problem was being given to them and they were expected to solve it on their tailor frame. Everything was ordered. Okay. So this is the first problem. The second problem was if today you are talking about these children, you know, you want them to study, you want them to have content also, you have to be able to teach them, right? How many teachers in the, even in the regular schools that we have, right, the uh, schools for the sighted, you will not get a teacher without a B.Ed. degree. Every teacher has to have a minimum B.Ed. degree. You go to their schools, most of the teachers are class 10 or class 12 pass. Okay, they don't have the qualification to teach, but they are teaching. Trust me, they are very good teachers. They are very well meaning, they are very kind, they really want to help. They do a, you know, a very good job, given the constraints that they are in, they do a very good job. But they are not qualified, they are, most of the 50% of them are blind, am I right with you? 50% of them are blind themselves. They have not learnt uh, science and math in school. But because you don't have teachers who are up for the job, these uh, people are teaching. And they, whenever we would go to the school, they would, you know, even now, I mean, they basically come to us to ask us, tell us how we should teach. What should we tell so that I can explain? I don't know how to explain. One teacher once told me, I don't know how to explain uh, how a pyramid looks because it says it's like a mountain. I don't know how a mountain looks. Right? So the context itself is not there. How do you explain? Look at the books themselves, the content in the books. It will say, uh, it will draw a curve, a parabola and say it looks like an, uh, an L shaped curve or a U shaped curve. What is L? What is U? Have they ever seen? That context is not there. So the, the, therefore, you know, the, the teaching community again is one group of people that we really needed to understand much better and try to help. So that's one. The third thing like what we began with about, you know, the rolling out of technologies of the infrastructure required, toolkits required and other things required to teach these subjects. If you focus only on science and math, forget the other subjects because we can't be focusing on everything, we focus on science and math. And if you look at science and math, you need certain tools and gadgets to be able to make that, you know, convey the message and the concept to them. There were hardly anything in the schools and even if there were, they were not being used. It's not that there are not, there are, there is an NIVH. Yeah. Sorry, you just had a question there, uh, when you said about teacher or community not being fully active, so is there a, a, a proper content for teacher education itself, especially for blind, at least in there is. Ways? Yes, so and that's what I was just coming to right now, that NIVH exists, national, right? So NIVH has teacher training courses, there are, um, all the metros have it, even some other cities have it, I'll come to you. Okay, they have it, but what they teach there is very generic. It's a special education course and they'll, tell, they'll teach the teacher to, you know, do this. When the teacher goes back to school, you know, the teacher has no, there is no way for you to understand whether the teacher is really using it in school or not first. And you need to have, you know, uh, it, it's, it's not easy actually. Honestly speaking, it's not easy. So these people, when they go back to the school also, very few actually get to using those tools and teaching them, using them in the classroom. For example, you have a geometry kit, which is about this big, right? About, you know, a foot long, uh, at least if not more, the geometry kit. Now imagine every child using that kit for doing, you know, drawing. Not that it's not possible, it's possible. But the time it takes, you can't have a 45 minute period where, you know, you focus on every, a class has a minimum of 12 children for the teacher to focus on each child. So that is where, you know, this, the role of technology and infrastructure, where you need much, something out of what was happening in the box last few decades, right? Yeah. So. Hey man, the specialties in diploma and education. Yes. So there is one course, right? Yes, special education, D.Ed. courses there. Yeah. yeah. So is it different from uh, special school and the government school or the no. No. So, 
in fact you know what out of the 45 schools that in karnataka that are for the especially for the blind most are private schools only maybe five or six are government schools the rest are all private schools so the infrastructure and and many of these are run by uh, you know uh, social uh, organizations charitable trusts and stuff like that so it's uh, it's it, there is the intention too but you know putting everything together somehow is not happening and we'll analyze why it's not happening okay. Okay. also special education and they doing they include a lot of other disability uh, they do abilities. absolutely they right yes so they when they are teaching special education they teach everything as a you know as a group because they do it for maybe 2 years and they teach everything so the focus first of all focusing only on visually impaired and then focusing only on science and math it doesn't happen many of the like i said many of the teachers who go there are themselves uh, visually impaired so you know for them to actually learn that and then because they never studied it in school then come back and teach so it's kind of the task is very huge so we will go a little quickly at this not finished so then you know the the most important one is probably the last one where there is a myth and we think that this person cannot see so that person cannot think right it's our perspective that we impose on that person we, we don't know what they honestly speaking i don't blame anybody because i think we all of us who have gone to you know uh, uh, regular schools which have not had a visually impaired person in the class or a hearing impaired person in the class or will not appreciate it because it doesn't come in our day to they're not visible they're not there in the classroom so we don't know right the system itself has been like this and so there's a myth it's been percolating for years that you know they they, they will this is not for them in fact for, forget about that it was like you know even last year i was talking to somebody from the university of leeds he's doing a phd in bio uh, something uh, pharma some kind of thing he was very interested in working with us and he was on a call with me and um, we were talking to him about the hackathon about you know other things and and that leads to employability and stuff and he was telling me why are you doing this why don't you actually find out what they are good at and make those traits and then accordingly create employment so you can understand with the perspective that comes you know we are basically saying we sh- we are the ones to decide who is good at what right make those you know uh, trades and allocate people to them like you saw in the morning you were showing the messios the you know so, so you basically identify oh that person might be he cannot see therefore he can hear well so he must be a musician so you know the let him learn singing after that even if he ha- cannot do anything else at least he can go and sit outside right so that's what's been happening right in this country forever <laughs> so that's the myth and then you know the uh, the the biggest thing what we found is that because of this percolating thing vicious cycle there's a big lack of role models like she was saying there were only about 100 people maybe in the whole country who studied science and math and higher education and now you know it's known in education that you do something because you see somebody else has done it and that does not exist and therefore let's so basically now to solve these problems what were the initiatives required so let's look at each uh, each of these buckets so for accessible science and math content we said we needed to design modular solutions we basically needed to create the content first thing the content was non existent we needed to needed to create the content take the book make the content accessible so that the child will understand so whatever material is there make it write it in such a way present it in such a way that the child understands that second you make it available to the child in the formats that they understand you give them audio files you give them braille books you give them uh, you know diagrams which are tactile whatever you know try and solve the problem through creating these kind of solutions give a child a kit so that you know for every you know chapter they will have something to fall back upon right so that was the first thing the second that was the first initiative required the second thing was about the instructors right so for the instructors you basically like we decides uh, we just now discussed we needed a pool of certified teachers now certified quote and quote does not mean purely nih uh, certified or you know special education certified certified but for the job at hand right and something we needed to design something for that so this yeah. Yeah. Like, is it how different is it uh, teaching uh, mathematics to visual impaired students and uh, non visual impaired 
so consider this okay uh, you know you you are trying to teach a child uh, the area of a triangle okay so what you would do is you would draw a triangle you will draw the perpendicular and then you will say this is how this is the formula you use and you will explain very very visual right you need the board you need to draw you need to be able to explain it in terms of a of maybe even if you are try, if you are a really good teacher you will give examples from real world you will give you will take applications take your uh, you know something and say that you know or maybe touch something and see you know you will put things together and explain the biggest problem that teachers in these schools have is they don't have a reference context they don't know with what they they can explain so that the child will understand and because they're not being able to draw on the board and there is nothing else so usually what they will do is they will go with some strings and wool or something or a velcro at best and you know make a tactile picture and try to explain and how many people have the patience to do that right so that is why the challenge comes so but the, yes there the are this like the last point hmm. you see the people actively discourage or uh, encourage people to pursue others yeah, yeah. they feel they could yeah would this be a projection of their own cluelessness absolutely that to... that's absolutely what we feel that has been the case forever is that because we don't know how to teach them we think that they cannot uh, and one more the, the thing is like um, suppose you want to explain a human body okay so uh, if it's a sighted child you might draw it it looks like a 2d thing so the same diagram if you even make it accessible and show it to a visually impaired student he or she wouldn't be able to get you need mm -hmm. 3d stuff for all the complex 2d diagrams you need a 3d representation for them to understand like most uh, most solutions are designed the way sighted people can see and how they can grasp so when you look at it from a visually impaired person's point of view the context and the way it's delivered and the way it's understood and retained everything changes especially in this diagonal representation and and higher math higher math it's completely like uh, for example calculus and all of it so it's it's a very big problem because they don't allow computers to your exams and then you have to do most of it orally and you have lot of issues like scribes those who write for you are in some lower grades you know i had experience like one whole year i struggled and at the end of the exam someone takes my hand and then just like draw some circle and one line and tell them look look this this is how this is the paper so i don't understand i go home and find out it's theta so it's it's a such a complex problem firstly you don't have books and um, you you don't have scribes to write your exam so it, it's like a so yeah so it's it's you're absolutely right that you know it's a perspective that you know we need to turn the mirror on ourselves and you know come back and see so so we'll see instead of getting into we'll try to understand you know how to analyze how we analyze this problem right so therefore the need for all this so, so to be able to uh, do this uh, you know we needed to create a pool of teachers for the in infrastructure and technology aids we needed to design assistive technologies and to you know to basically bust the myths we needed to you know engage with existing role models and kind of create more awareness you know beat the drum a little more right now obviously you can see if this is the mandate that we are going to do solving you know addressing each one of these challenges itself it's mammoth right each one in itself is a huge problem to solve so therefore we decided that you know let's go in a slightly theoretical way right try to understand because people have researched it people have researched these problems over the years people have tried to address it nobody has done all of this on purpose whatever happened is not on purpose like you can't blame the whole of humanity for you know the you know problems that arose to a group of people but the fact is it arose because of certain changes in society and that's why i know the first bit of disability and you know it's like repetitive and a bo gets boring but it was very important for us to present that part because that evolution of the concept of and perspectives on disability why it changed and when it changed is very important and you see how we tap on that to come up with our solutions so basically if you look at it basically what we did is after all that you know going to the field field work and and i know collecting the data from all these various quarters 
we decided to go in a very theoretical framework way and try to understand who who has said what about you know these kind of studies we found a very interesting framework which is called the biopsychosocial framework developed by george engel and this particular framework gives equal weightage to three aspects biological psychological and social so like what you you saw that the concept of disability was changing from a medical model to a social model to eventually a humanitarian problem right but if you look at how how then to solve the problem also you need to understand all the perspectives it not it's not like when you decide when when you understood that it was a social problem the medical problem didn't stop occurring it was still there right when you finally decided it was a development issue the social issue did not stop right it was still there so when you when you want to analyze the you know magnitude of the problem you need to understand that your solutions need to be tuned to you know be receptive to these uh, you know you know signals right and therefore uh, we this we found this very very effective and all our you know uh, future work was kind of around this so the you know biopsychos a social enabled technology solutions what we felt was you know a few of these which we found that we would probably need to work on one was you know the first thing that i told you was the content right the books did not exist right so we needed something called a refreshable braille display did you want to talk about the braille display and yeah. why you need it yeah so refreshable braille display is like uh, you, uh, the children who are reading the content or the users can read in braille but the content that is digital can be directly converted into braille using actuators and the person who is reading can touch and feel yeah, but why do so, we need so uh, why do we why do we need it is because um now there are students who there are twelve students in a class for example so each student should have one book now the for example you write one page of print that is equal to like three pages in braille and these papers have to be special braille papers which are thick so for one uh, chapter you just need one entire book so one cited textbook Or That's the magnitude of the yeah. problem. You basically have a book of thirty, you know, uh, something of thirty pages, which comes to about more than hundred pages of braille, which is triple its size. And you have to print it using special equipment, and then you have, and the child can never carry it around, right? Forget about you know. So that is the reason also partly that you know it was not there. The books were not there. It's very difficult and an expensive affair to print. If there was one book in the class, it would be with the teacher. That way, the teacher is. Uh, you know uh, uh, visually impaired otherwise you there would be no book now to solve that problem we we found that this is the most important thing that we need to first create a refreshable braille display now such devices exist there are such devices in the market you can go uh, abroad and buy somewhere between the range of 3000 to 5000 each so can you give that to every child no right so that is that's why the quotation around uh, affordable so that's the first technology we started looking for and trying to put a team together to work so that is one the second 5000 dollars for a single actuator no 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 for a single uh, display which has about 20 cells 20 to 40 cells each a refreshable display. braille display yeah yeah i can if you are around sometime we can show you one which we yeah so now there are indian versions available one or two uh, companies have come up with uh, refreshable braille displays of you know with the minimum uh, price about 25 to 30000 rupees you are getting but even that is not affordable like we told you right 90% of these people come from rural and poor families then they cannot afford so even 25 30 is very expensive for them 30 rupees and uh, is, it, uh, is, it, is the price high because of scale i'm saying this Yes, partly. Yes, because of scale. Partly, yes. partly, and also partly because it's very uh, niche technology. Is it a monopoly? Like, really it's not exactly a monopoly. In fact, people who, in fact, I know people who work on this, and I, right now we are also working. What they are doing is basically they are opening up the what what they have. Like you know, the design is open design. So I wouldn't say it's monopoly. It's At the same right. time. Yeah, there are uh, the you know so, so for example now in the Scandinavian countries it's highly subsidized because whatever is the price it doesn't matter the government will buy it and give it to every blind person 
so they have one at hand always. But this doesn't, in all countries cannot afford that, so it's not possible. So as a policy, <coughs> uh, maybe that's the better option. Right? See, because of the volume, of course, the technical, there are limitations, so definitely the government has to mention something. Yeah, the role of the government uh, certainly is there, but again, you know, we, we also didn't go to that that stage where, you know, we were able to make a judgment on what was right and what was wrong. What we recognize is that, yeah, this happened and right now also we are even able to talk of refreshable braille display because there are technology has developed till there, right? If it if that had not happened, then, you know, we wouldn't even be talking about it. And trust me, that would not have happened if there, the, you know, economy wasn't open for people to innovate on. And obviously, if people are innovating, they will want to see returns on their, on their, you know, intellectual property. So, so it's, there is no right or wrong in it. Yes, but the government playing a role certainly from the policy side, from, you know, the uh, involvement side, all that is certainly. Yeah, yeah, the options are that, you know, to develop an affordable technology. Yeah. That's yeah. another thing. Yeah. Okay. Then, yeah. That, so, even Probably. as are its own challenges. Yeah. The second option is that, okay, let's not focus on that, there is a solution, okay, let's uh, work on something which sort of wherein even masses can afford it, right, instead of looking at a technology, mm -hmm. let's look at the support and, you know, make it affordable for the masses, I think that's Yeah, so making it affordable is another, it's not, like, if, if we try, we are trying that, right, but it's, um, let me assure you, it's not an easy thing. Because you have to make the technology affordable means what? It's something that you're you're trying to achieve. There's one thing about design. If you if you are trying to design a, a, a you know a smartphone, you will want even however cheap the phone is, you will want all the features of the iPhone in it. Yes or no? Yeah. It's, that's what we design. So same way, if we, even if you are making an affordable technology, you cannot uh, compromise on the features. Right, so that that's where the challenges come. You know, so the same yeah. like electric car. Maybe yeah. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. Electric car today cannot mm -hmm. compete with the other cars mm -hmm. from a cost perspective. Mm -hmm. So whatever R and D you do it, so even best minds have to, you know, they're putting in their uh, efforts, but then they're not able to meet the pricing. So what is happening is government is coming into the picture, saying that they are incentivizing. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think Certainly that government has a role, I agree with you. Probably, yeah. you know, that can be the thing. Yeah, what role, role I don't know. Now, whether, uh, whether uh, you know, just uh, paying off for everyone is a solution or what, there are many ways the government has, it's not a, see the government, I won't say that, you know, has not been, there is today every company the, uh, has to give 2% of its uh, funds for CSR, right? So, there is a way, uh, if not directly, indirectly that the government is but trying to. Say From who? Huh. Is there a direct subsidy? By the government? No. I think you know that. Not <laughs> just that. The government earlier earlier importing braille, braille devices, braille printer and all was, uh, uh, you know, uh, duty free. Now they charge a huge sum if you import because they want you to make it here. Yeah. So, yeah. one more challenge is that there's not only braille display that's required for self yeah. education. Yeah. There are a whole lot of technologies. Now, when you think of making everything like this subsidy model, that's not going to work that's because there are a whole lot true. of technologies. Just by reading Braille, you're not going to learn science and art. And when and you also, work with the government, just to quickly yeah. intervene here, so when you work with the government and you go to the Ministry of Social Justice and Empowerment, yeah, you know, we want more subsidies for, say, the refreshable Braille display. The secretary over there will say, you know, there are so many more basic things for which the funds need to be allocated, this is far higher in the agenda. So often the priority doesn't match and you know the funds are always limited uh, to this uh, ministry. So hence many times is, even if they want, they are not able to do it. There is a scheme called ADEP scheme where they do provide some financial support but many times the quality of uh, material which is procured is very substandard. Sure. So that was the first thing. Then, uh, you know, basically in addition, you needed to, what we figured is, like I told you, the content itself wasn't there. So we needed to ensure that the whatever the books contain, right, they should be there on an online platform now that you have MOOCs and you have everything else. So it should be in an, but it should be accessible to the uh, visually impaired child. So we decided to basically try and uh, come up with uh, an accessible online platform and which will have the content and it will not just have the content it will also have the 
instruction kit like you said does the teacher know how to teach right they know they don't the answer is they don't so then how do you solve this so try and first of all we'll, sit, we'll tell you how else we do but in the lms we're trying to come up with you know uh, an instruction kit which the teacher can follow and at least you know conduct the class then um, coming up with the training curriculum for teachers and then other games and tools so these were some uh, then uh, creating the laboratory laboratory is the you know one of the most inaccessible places for visually impaired people right so how to make it accessible and then uh, you know how to be able to finally be able to ensure that these people network with the entire stem community community right so that was it so this is all what we needed to do so what we uh, using that biopsychosocial framework like i said we came up with a um, uh, this is a uh, unfortunately it's a graphic kit it's basically i'm just uh, what we did is the whole uh, we tried to analyze now you, i showed you the whole problem set is huge if you were to solve it and thinking the vision empower will go alone and solve all of these problems it won't happen in my lifetime and in how many lifetimes right so what we decided to do was work with a partner ecosystem where we can make it happen there are many people in this space who are working on various things in their own areas and each one is working in some uh, niche space so when we looked at the ecosystem that exists today we found that you can broadly group it into four large groups one are the people who are the pedagogy experts they create the books they write the books right so they are one group there is another group who are the resource providers so for example in bangalore there are two or three large resource providers who provide the braille books on demand free of cost okay they provide it to the child so if the child actually goes to the that say matru chaya or a mitra jyoti and says i need these 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 books please give it to me they will give it print and give right so that is the kind of plus other teacher trainings and all that they try to you know work on those things then there are the technology firms now like a microsoft or you know other firms who basically are creating assistive technologies to help with uh, education and then there are specific assistive technology labs nowadays and many of the uh, large engineering colleges and other science uh, stem related uh, you know colleges you have assistive technology labs who are trying to work on state of the art assistive technology so broadly this is the supply side you know they are trying to address the problems and on the demand side of course you have the schools who have the need to raise the demands and you know. so this is what we found it is and we decided that if we have to work then we have to collaborate with everybody and work we have to ensure that everybody knows what the other is doing most of what we found is that there are lot many ngos who are working in this space then the resource providers like matru chaya mitra jyoti xrcvc these they they have their resources so we try to work with them on you know creating the having the teacher training programs and so on and so forth for the technology firms we are trying to create partnerships wherein those technologies which which i said we will create now we are just a one year organ one year old organization uh, creating a team huge team of technology experts is a dream right uh, we have just one or two people right now but what we are doing is we are collaborating with these other technology firms and trying to come up with a model and i'll tell you how that works out and then uh, there are other technology labs now triple it being in triple itb this is another collaborative uh, effort which is uh, uh, we are trying to kind of create where the basically it's like an academia industry partnership where basically we leverage on the knowledge of the experts here at triple it and the student pool that you have here to come up with technology solutions so that's how we work and we we have a uh, a uh, couple of schools who are our partners where we are trying out these solutions pilot solutions are these schools in kannada yes right now in bangalore because yeah yeah eventually but there is already like because of some of the things that we have done there is already people are you know calling us asking us to go and try it in their schools you know but we would do it probably later once we have a proof of concept which is you know uh, uh, verified so yeah so for the you know content that we created the books the tactile diagrams and all of those we the we basically uh, had this proof of concept program for lanuga where you know we brought the children we tried our material 
we, you know we, we some of the experiential learning con you know uh, concepts were tried with them and uh, we, based on that then we proceeded with creating more material then we created the you know teacher training program so this was for, so the first one about content was tried out through this proof of concept anubhav the teacher training program called pragya which we have where we basically we we work with the special education teachers we we split the whole uh, you know uh, curriculum for the whole year into three trimesters and for every trimester we bring the teachers over and we run through the whole uh, you know curriculum and we basically the, the special education teachers teach them how to go back and teach because otherwise it will not be a scalable model the current teacher needs to learn how to teach of course you need to create more teacher but the current teacher also needs to so we we organize these every trimester uh, another one is coming up in january uh, and then we have these technology projects which we have initiated along with triple it bank uh, bangalore so the first one like i told you the uh, lms which was created so which is be being created it's an accessible uh, lms which is to follow i i'm sure ankit has you know uh, uh, trained you on, on, on you now you understand the need for accessibility so we went with a a uh, particular platform which is open and we try to make it accessible and then we are putting in the content in there then we basically like uh, vidya was talking about the 3d uh, diagrams right you want to talk about the uh, 3d diagram uh? yeah so uh, for everything for most of the complex diagrams are usually in that student can learn to grasp the concept if there's a 2d representation so you need a 3d model for which um, someone cannot manually design those to be modeled to convert manually convert to be modeled into 3d so um we are trying to design a software with some algorithms which can do that for some of the diagrams yeah and also 3d printing using 3d printing yes. you're doing the software designing yes. here at triple id here at triple id so the model which we work is like this the collaborative model is that the there's a principal investigator in the institute and we have a, a vision empowered engineer and there are students student interns and together we work on that so basically this particular one like she was saying is a an algorithm basically which will simplify your diagram so in the book you have so many diagrams so you take any of the diagram and then you pass it through that algorithm it simplifies it and then you uh, you basically get an outline of that diagram in a particular way there are it's it sounds it sounds much simpler than it is and what's the uh, algorithm Still have good math, right? Math, math and science both. So oh, you need oh, diagrams oh, for both. Oh, yeah. So for math, actually, uh, good that you raise that question. Uh, in math, if you see most of the diagrams in the math book in schools are very symmetrical, and you know, it's possible to uh, even not use all this. So what we did in the Braille book is we basically uh, found a way to import it into the you know uh, uh, the file which is going to go to the Braille embosser. and therefore i can i i should have brought some samples actually so and therefore uh, we, you can print that in a perforated way so you get raised diagrams symmetrical diagrams we were able to do that so we printed diagrams on the book using the braille printer itself and uh, sorry graphs graphs also so like some of them but like i told you we are just piloting right so it's a class 5 material but yeah we have printed graphs we have also printed graphs using this 3d uh, tactile thing um uh, it's it's much simpler than you know biology diagrams so for that actually this the other you can you uh, tell them about the labeling yeah so um in science especially in biology you now when you take a diagram there are many labels some of them might have even 15 labels so having a braille kind of labels is very difficult um because the children will get confused What exactly? Now, if you take a cell which is mitochondria, which is ribosome, and which is ribosome, so brain is very voluminous. It takes a lot of space. So we are trying to create uh, uh, a solution wherein there there will be a diagram. For example, a cell which is raised, the student can touch and feel, and when he or she touches a particular part, so uh, it it reads out what you are touching and gives some. minimal description of what the part is like mitochondria is the power house of the cell something like that an audio label an audio label uh, when whenever he or she touches different parts it just it's audio label yeah. 
So and so these are the other than the uh-huh. other one. Yeah. Or the same about the LMS uh, that is being created. Yeah. Did you find something open source in the market? Yes, yes. We used Open Index. Yeah. So we we basically there was a big process. Initially, we we started. We thought we'll make our own accessible. We took you know tools, and then we found that it will be very expensive. Then we tried Moodle. Moodle also has many accessibility features. We tried Moodle, but even that was not good enough. And you know, we have a we have seen one student intern work for a whole semester doing that. And then uh, finally, we then used Open edX because it provides a, its focus on accessibility is much more than any other. But we use that platform. But we have done a lot of customizations, and we are, we will probably be you know. Uh, Putting back our code back to Open edX very soon. Just one thing about the LMS is like first, why we need to have separate LMS when there are many is because firstly the software should be completely accessible for a blind person, and second thing, we have a lot of online math courses, but it's not like if it's digital, a blind person can read it. It's not like that because when you when you want to find any equation for example on the internet the screen reader itself doesn't read it for you it has to be converted into accessible formats such as latex and there should be a separate plugin which can convert all the equations to words and read it so the content should be made accessible in a way that screen reader can interpret and and then all the content should be supplemented with the braille material so when you when you just give a problem there should be something uh, some supplement In tactile format for the child to touch and feel that, and the software should be accessible. So all these three things put together, we decided we have an LMS platform. So mm-hmm. these are the things we had to construct. Yes, yes, these are the things we had to construct, and uh, like that's why you know. So if you um, uh, real the initially I began with the biopsychosocial framework, right? So all the technologies we sh- we said should imbibe some of that. Should should imbibe the fact that it is not solving only a biological problem or only a social problem or only a psychological problem. Many assistive technologies are just created and shoved under the carpet because they are never used, right, Ankit? Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Most are, of them are uh, yeah. glorifying the labs shelves. Exactly, they just stay there. Okay, nobody uses them. And why? I mean, ideally, you would think, oh, there are technologies, and then why are these people not using it, right? They are so unintuitive. That you know, people don't use it, and uh, trust me, I we did. This is our research. We basically went and spoke to people who make it, and when we asked them, "How did you create it?" So they did not even talk to the user before they make it. They go with their own, you know, interpretation of what they want, what the technology should be like. They create it, and then they go and say, "Try it. It should work. Why are you not using it?" What we are basically uh, heading to is exactly what I was trying to say. Is that if when we create a device and we are creating a technology because we we know that this technology will work as far as we have designed it so it should work, but who is going to use that device and what are the what are what are the parameters that that person is going to apply when or attributes that person is going to think about when using that device? You know how many questions come up about you know the that yeah I know it is a basically what you are addressing is a biological problem right. Now, where is the psychological part coming in? Am I thinking about whether the person is ready for it or not? Does he want to be seen using that de- that particular thing or not? Right? Th- there's so much stigma that is attached, maybe, to that, and they don't want to be seen using it. There are so many various depends also from which strata of the you know society you come and what what how you want to be perceived by others. There are so many aspects to it. It's not like we can say that you yeah, are created and of course there is no one single line solution also but at least when you create a technology if you consider all these perspectives then you the uptake might be better than what it is yeah okay. and then so so putting all that together now the question about you know what i told you about what we decided to do regarding the perspectives the myths that are floating around you know how to create more awareness right So one of the groups which we collaborate with is an I STEM. It's an inclusive STEM group. Like she was saying, there are about maximum 100 people who are in STEM education and higher education. There are about 25 to 30 people who are in higher education right now, and they have created a self advocacy team. We partnered with them, and for the first time last year, here in Triple IT, we had the uh, inclusive hackathon. So we basically had uh, uh, you know um, 12 groups of five members each. 
where we brought brought people from the industry. We had the visually impaired programmers, and we had students from Triple IT. So you had two visually impaired programmers, two uh, um, people from industry, and one Triple IT student working on a problem. Over three days, we had the hackathon, and I'll just play this little. Hi, my name is Karthik, and I am a co-founder at iSTEM. The goal of the iSTEM hackathon was essentially to bring together blind computer science students, corporate professionals, and sighted computer science students together to hack on projects that they are passionate about. And going into the event, we had three broad objectives. The first objective was for all of these participants to challenge themselves by working in highly diverse teams. We were sure that they would actually be experiencing a lot that they haven't experienced before, a lot many perspectives that they haven't considered before, and really, you know, challenge and question some of the preconceived notions and biases that they may have about each other. So we wanted them to break these biases, to overcome these biases, and really try and understand each other's abilities, each other's challenges, strengths, weaknesses, and learn from the overall experience. The second objective was for them to really understand what diversity leads to. Diversity leads to better products because you're now considering perspectives or ideas that you'd never thought about. You're now thinking about problems that you'd never thought were problems. So we wanted them to appreciate the beauty of diversity and how that leads to better products and better product development life cycles. And finally, the third objective was for participants, especially the sighted participants, to try and understand accessibility hands-on and bring it back to their organizations. It's one thing to take an accessibility course or an accessibility brown bag, but it's completely a different thing to actually see that in action. Because now the product that you're developing will be unusable by your own teammates if it's not accessible. So we wanted them to see how those changes, those two or three lines of code that they were writing to enhance the accessibility of their apps, the transformative impact that could have in helping that product now being usable by their own teammates. So we wanted them to really take this knowledge with them and understanding with them so that they can now be the champions for accessibility at their respective organizations. At Vision Aid, one of the programs we run is to train visually impaired students' uh, skills in the programming languages. So students stay with us for one or two semesters, you know, each semester lasting about three and a half to four months to learn programming. And we find that once they learn programming, going to these hackathons is an excellent progression for them. So at these hackathons, they are able to connect with peers, they are able to connect with people from the industry, with students on college campuses and they are able to build exciting projects and actually understand what it is to apply academic skills into building practical solutions and in some cases also getting connected with employment opportunities so these hackathons have been uh, a real asset to vision aid and a boon to our students the inclusive stem hackathon provides corporates with their unique opportunity to witness the vibrant space which is ideal for the development of inclusive technologies. Secondly, it allows corporates an opportunity to recognize the talent and capabilities of these passionate individuals who are so determined to overcome their challenges and focus on their strengths instead. And thirdly, it allows the corporates to absorb the learnings from the hackathon, go back to their workplaces and implement the accommodations that are required so that they may be able to employ talented individuals and provide them with an opportunity to bloom to their full potential.
Yeah, so th that was one uh, networking. The other is the Ananda volunteer program which we started. So it's basically, see, when we study, we go back home and we have somebody to tell us to go back do our homework, somebody to follow up with us on, you know, whether we understood something or not, right? Encourage us when we do well, scold us when we don't do well, right? All these things are there, part and parcel of growing up. Most of the uh, schools for the blind are residential, the children stay in school. They're a very happy lot, no doubt, but they don't get that reinforcement. So we started this program where we go over weekends with the volunteers, sit down with the children with their books and we've given each child a book now. This, so we take the book, the you know, uh, volunteer comes with a printed book and we go through the material that was done in class over the week and reinforce what was done in class. So this is a big hit among the children and they love their uh, guides. And a uh, couple of recognitions here which Vidya has brought to Vision Empowered. Uh, she won the Nama Bangalore Award. She also won the Thai Delhi uh, NCR Award and I think for three or four more other awards which I don't have right now. Mm -hmm.